ACEC is excited to announce that registration is now open for its fall conference taking place in Marco Island, Florida this October. That's right, after a year of Zoom and virtual meetings, we're excited to be bringing our fall conference back as an in-person event. And we can't tell you how excited we are to look forward to seeing you there in person for all of the content, networking, and education that the fall conference is known for. Log on to www.acec.org for more information. We can't wait to see you there. Welcome to the Engineering Influence Podcast presented by the American Council of Engineering Companies and sponsored by the ACEC Life Health Trust. Today, we're going to talk about what it takes to create successful teams within an engineering firm with Ted Gerber, who is president of Addison Resources Group in New York City. Ted has more than 25 years of experience working with firms in a wide variety of industries to improve leadership effectiveness by sharpening skills in leadership, negotiating, collaboration, influencing, and empowering teams. Welcome to the program. Thank you. So when you talk about building empowered teams, are, are you talking about an enterprise-wide, which seems rather challenging, um, or smaller groups within an organization? Well, I don't think it's an either or. I think the, the goal is that you'd wanna have an organization where people are comfortable working in teams in a wide variety of uh, areas, including a functional team, a project team, a vertical team, you know, et cetera. So I don't think it's an either or. You, know, you may have to start with some selected areas of the organization working more in a team environment, but the goal should be, because if you think about it, a CEO and his or her direct reports are a team as well. So it starts at the top in a sense too, because they're a team. Whether they call themselves a team or not, they are a team. So as I get, I guess in, in that uh, an organization, regardless of its size, is a is a bunch of teams of so different groups and, and together it's sort of like a pyramid of teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, in engineering firms and really in, in life, we tend to put the most skilled and high, high performing people on the team, um, you know, for example, in a project team, but sometimes they don't play well with others. What, what do you do if you've got something like that on your team? Yeah, well, that's one of the, uh, the key elements of having an effective team, that the team be able to effectively manage conflict. Because one of the reasons you bring disparate points of view together in a team is you want some tension, some creative tension, if you will, or some conflict and different points of view being expressed. Now, you have to be able to manage that effectively. And people need to have, in some cases, maybe ways of working or some protocols or um, a guide that they can use when they do get into those situations where there's conflict, that they can work through it effectively uh, without personalizing it in a sense, you know, where people have hard feelings or they feel they've been put upon in some way, that they're able to separate the personality from the business problem. And to have strong conflictual arguments, if you will, around the business problem and be able to separate that from the personalization of that. Uh, and that should be a goal. And teams need to really think about because it's gonna come up one way or the other and they need to think about how they're gonna handle it when it does come up. Because I've seen some teams where they don't handle it well and they become totally dysfunctional where people hold grudges or have stories or perceptions of each other that just don't go away based on some argument or conflict they had discussing a business issue. That's not healthy. Right, um, I, is, is, it a, is it enough to work with the individual to make this person play better or is it a, is it a, is it a function of the team itself? It can be both, uh, it depends, every team is different. In some cases, it might be an individual in the team that is um, sort of causing the problems where the team is not able to effectively resolve conflict and some individual coaching or working with that individual might, might help in that process. But when I work with teams, I do want to get them to think about as a team, how they manage conflict, separate and apart from the individuals on the team as a, as a group. Um, and it can be supported with individual coaching, but the team needs to really understand how they're going to address conflict when it comes up. Conflict is not necessarily bad, is it? No. In a team. Yeah. In fact, as I say, that's why you have a team in a sense. You want some creative tension and conflict because that brings out the best business solutions um, as opposed to sort of a group think or just following one individual and saying, well, we never have challenged that person or we don't get any really interesting alternatives to what that person is proposing, the leader of the team, for example. Do you think um, in, in hiring, uh, in an engineering firm hiring people that, that um, that taking into consideration their team building um, ability or team, or team membership ability even is a, is a good thing to look at? 
Yeah, I think that could be and should be one of the criteria because more and more in any organization, and organizations are trending towards being more team-based, if you will. So the team skills are really critical, I think, as you hire somebody. So do they have the team skills? And what are some of those skills? To me, is the ability to be articulate and candid and not shy away from your point of view, but also at the same time, on the other side of that, to be receptive to others' points of view. And to maybe in the interview process, try to get a sense of how receptive they are when somebody disagrees with them. How do they work through that? And the other thing too is, do they think beyond their own functional area? Because if you're on a team, one of the things that's important for a team is you're gonna have people have individual perspectives on that team in their own areas that they're looking to achieve objectives uh, on. That they have to, if the team's gonna succeed, be able to think beyond their own individual objectives, say what's good for the team. Uh, can I make the sacrifices required so the team succeed? Or Michael Jordan once said, there is no I in the word team. So sort of probing that in an interview process to see are people open to think more broadly, uh, not just on their own objectives, but the team succeeding as well. Um, and also I would say the ability to demonstrate some empathy and understanding for others' points of view. You know, I think these are key things to address in the recruiting process as you interview people. Um, I, I would, the, the, the second one you mentioned, the uh, ability to, to look beyond your own uh, selfish interests uh, mm -hmm. in, for the, that's a tough one, I, I would imagine, uh, in, a, in a competitive business. Yeah, it is, because a lot of times the reward systems are such for your individual, you're rewarded to achieve your individual objectives or functional objectives, whatever they might be. Uh, but, and it's great if you can have some team objectives where everybody's rewarded, but even if you don't have that, it's really about shifting the mindset to say, who am I accountable for? Most people think I'm accountable for my own success or the success of my direct reports, but to think from a team perspective, it's like, I got to start thinking about I'm accountable for others on the team succeeding and the leader as well and the organization. And that's a, that's a shift in mindset, which is not easy to achieve, but good teams are able to do that. And I remember, I think back to my own personal experience when I played basketball many, many years ago and I was on teams. Uh, I, I may not have liked certain individuals that were on the team with me uh, for a variety of reasons, or they may have not liked me, uh, but when the, the ball was thrown out on the court and the game started, I was high-fiving them when they scored as they high-fived me when I scored because the goal was to win the game. It wasn't just to build up the individual stats. So it can happen, but in that case, in the, the basketball example, the coach had a lot to say about that too because he was the one monitoring that to say, look, I, I'm seeing too much selfishness. I'm going to make substitutions or what have you. So you knew if you played from that very selfish place that it, you might not have a lot of playing time. Uh, and, but yet at the same time, you knew that there were certain people that brought certain strengths. Like I was never one that they passed the ball to just to take the last shot because that wasn't my strength. But we all were willing to defer to the person that had that strength because we knew that was the best chance of winning the game. So we put our selfish interest aside to make that happen. So I think the same thing has to apply in a business team as well. You got to recognize the strengths and recognize you may have to put aside some of your own ego to help that person or that part of the uh, team to succeed. In in a in an organization, a hierarchical organization, um, it's it, it's I've often found um, in my career that it's tough for a group to work uh, for a for a team to work if there is a wide hierarchical spread of the members. Like for example, if the CEO is a member of of the team, everyone suddenly kowtows to to the CEO's views. How do you is is that a situation that you deal with? Uh, it comes up sometimes, but uh, again, if you think about the, as I said earlier, the CEO has his or her team. So uh, it's generally speaking, the CEO, at least not in my experience, has been on a, on a project team, for example, generally speaking, it's more in the lower levels of the organization, mid-level, uh, but it's possible. But I think the ultimate thing is the, C the CEO or the head of the team needs to be able to recognize that they don't have all the answers. One of the reasons, again, you have a team with a leader is the leader doesn't have all the answers. The leader is looking for that creative tension and innovation from the other team members. So to make it work effectively, the leader's gotta be open to the feedback he or she may receive or the ideas and perceptions of others on the team. Because if that isn't there, if the CEO is sort of going through the motions, like I'm gonna create an illusion of a team, but ultimately I'm gonna make the decision, you're gonna demotivate people and people are gonna figure that out pretty quickly. So I think it's gotta be a genuine effort on the part of the leader of the team, if it's a CEO, for example, that they are willing to be open to others' perspectives and points of view. They don't have to agree with all of them, but they've got to be able to listen to them and be open and try to incorporate the ones that make sense versus it's always got to be my way. Um, and not create a facade of like, we're, we're really an empowered team here. <laughs> we're really not kind of thing. 
But you, in your career, you've worked, uh, you've helped a lot of CEOs with, with leadership issues and on team building in that situation, because CEOs tend to be sort of, a, you know, narcissistic, it would be a word. Um, how, do, how do you help them deal with that situation? Well, if, if I were coaching one, which I have, it, yes. you would do a 360 feedback on them and they would get some perception. It wouldn't just be my perception. It would be a perception from team members or, uh, or the stakeholders in the organization on how they're operating if they are playing more from a my way or the highway kind of place. And what's the impact of all that? You know, are people shutting down? Is the lack of creativity affecting the business results? So assuming, uh, and I was, when I coach somebody, I always say that you know, the biggest determinant of success in a coaching process is the motivation of the person being coached. And what a 360 feedback would do would create the awareness that this is an issue. Then it's up to the person to be really committed, the CEO level or any other executive in an organization. Do they really want to change that? Because if they can, then the coaching process can be of value or a team engagement process with them can be of value. If again, if they go through the motions and they really don't feel they, they, they need to change or want to change, it's going to be very difficult to change anybody. So um, the awareness is important, but then what do you do with it? is the next step. And I think today most CEOs recognize that you want to have, it's, it's like the difference between getting compliance versus commitment. Now, what you want to get out of your team is a real commitment because it's one thing to say they agree with the objectives, but how committed are they to implement them? And that's where you want the real commitment versus a compliance kind of situation where they implement them, but sort of at a minimum level, just so you're not going to be on their back, so to speak. I think most Good leaders recognize you want commitment, not compliance. Well, on that point about um, about objectives, a, a successful team it needs it needs to have a mission and, and goals clearly set set out. Who sets those? Is is it somebody outside the team sets the sets the goals and then the team acts on that, or is it the goals or is the team's first action to determine what its goals and mission are? You know, sometimes for teams, I'm not talking about the, well, even on the CEO level, because the board of directors is involved, obviously, but sometimes the objectives are set for you in a sense, you know, but even if that were the case, I think it's important for every team to have a mission and to spend some time thinking about what is the mission of this team in order to achieve those objectives that either have been given to us or we determine ourselves. Uh, and that's a process I think that needs involvement of everybody on the team. Uh, now, what you can do, and in some cases has happened is, I know of one case I'm working with now where the, the leader of the team asked everybody to frame uh, their, uh, their desire what, as to what the mission should be, and nobody responded. So in that case, I suggested that he create, in this case, a mission as a talking point, so to speak, and share with the team and say, okay, he didn't respond, but here's what I think it should be. What do you think? Uh, and to engage them from that level if they don't come up with it themselves. But usually on a team, you'll have, a, as, as in typical many teams, you'll have a couple of people that are very strong in terms of articulating what they think it should be. And others may be more reticent or quiet in doing so. And the goal would be to bring out the reticent or quiet ones and get their perspective, because many times their perspective is really a good one, but they don't speak up or they don't feel comfortable speaking up uh, in an environment because they're either intimidated or they don't think what they have to say is of value. And I think it's important for the leader of the team and other team members as well, not just the leader, to encourage those people to speak up. And everybody should ultimately contribute to the mission, but they may need some help along the way uh, with a, um, a mission framed by an individual or the leader of the team to help them think through it. And one of the aspects of, uh, of this current virtual world we're in is, is that it is possible to be in a meeting and to not say a word, you just put your microphone on mute and you just sit there. Are face-to-face -face meetings, better for for teams than than virtual meetings i would say as a general rule yes uh but the reality is we have more and more zoom meetings and the zoom team meetings and there's a i think the important thing there is to have some rules of engagement when you have those and it's really incumbent upon the person running the meeting it could be the leader or somebody else who's just facilitating the meeting that day to be cognizant of and trying to involve everybody because it's much easier in a sense to say nothing on a zoom meeting you know, because you'll have a few people again who will articulate a lot and others will sit back. You've got to draw those people in. And that may require you asking, hey, Bill, Mary, what do you think about this particular issue? Or have some preparation ahead of the meeting where everybody submits it ahead of time that you can refer to. There's different ways to do that. But I think it's, it's more of a challenge for the involvement versus everybody sitting in the room where you can see whether somebody's really engaged or not engaged. Unfortunately, for some of the Zoom meetings now, at least some of my clients have said, is sometimes it's hard to really see if somebody's engaged. They're looking at a camera, but you can sort of sense they're doing things on, the, on their iPhone without, and they're very good at, at not looking at the iPhone, but doing yes. it on, 
looking at the camera. So it is more challenging without a doubt in a Zoom environment. Yeah, we have we have meetings and sometimes I, I, I have to stare at someone for about five minutes to make sure they're, they're actually just haven't put up a photo of themselves. So um, just a, 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 on a closing note, um, in, you do, you've done some programs for us for ACC, uh, which are available on the uh, on demand uh, class yes. uh, schedule. <laughs> and and I, I, I attended one and you you talked about um, safety and trust as being key elements of a good em empowered team. And that struck me because I just not two words that I would not have put together with having a good team. What, what, why is that? Well, I think it's important. First of all, uh, you, you want to have each member of a team trust each other. And that means and trust can be defined in a lot of different ways. It could be expertise. I trust your expertise to do the job. It could be I trust that you've got, you know, you're supporting me. Could be I trust that you follow up on a commitment. It's a lot of ways to define trust. But to me, they're inter interlinked safety and trust. I have to feel safe as a team member that when I speak up, I trust things will not be held against me. If I disagree, let's say, with the leader or somebody else in the team, hopefully it's not personalized. Or people are going to make judgments about me. Boy, that was a stupid idea. Because if I get a sense of that, if I don't feel that safety is there, that I can speak up and be trusting of my fellow team members, I'm not going to speak up. Um, and unfortunately, that operates in some teams. And the goal in any team engagement I've done is to get people to be more comfortable speaking up and trusting each other. And that means having some candid conversations around what is preventing us from doing that. And maybe there's some past stories or history that has gone on within the team that we need to get out on the table, sort of the dead elephant in the room kind of thing, and, and resolve it so that I do feel that sense of safety and trust. If I'm not mistaken, a few years ago, there was some study of that. I don't know if it was Google or Amazon, I can't remember which one, but they study teams and what made teams, certain teams more effective than others. And this idea of being comfortable speaking up, having that sense of trust and safety to do that was one of the key determinants of whether a team was successful or not. Because Again, for those that are more reticent to speak up, and it can be a variety of reasons, and they may be just more introverted by nature or they're just hesitant you know, for a variety of reasons. But the more comfortable they feel speaking up, the more you're gonna get good thinking from everybody on the team. And creating that environment is not only up to the leader, it's up to everybody on the team as well. Uh, and that's a real key element, I think, for a successful team. And the other one I'd add with that too is having some empathy. Um, you know. Uh, because if I have empathy with others, and many times people don't really, at least in my experience on teams, they think they understand the challenges and pressures that each are under, but they really don't because they never ask the person. So I think once I understand the pressures and challenges on you and you on me, we have a better sense of empathy, you know, when we're under pressure and how, I, how can I help you? And that's a key element of the team as well. I want to help other team members versus saying, so lead, alluding back to what I said earlier about the, the enterprise objectives. As versus saying, I'm okay, I'm meeting my objectives, so I don't, therefore I don't have to worry about it. No, I should feel uncomfortable, even if I'm meeting my objectives, if somebody else is struggling. And that's where I want to have empathy and support for them to help them meet their objectives. And that's thinking more broadly than just beyond my own function. I think that's a good place to, to close it up. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Thank you, Jerry. Really appreciate it. Enjoyed it very much. You've been listening to Ted Gerber of Addison Resources Group, and this has been the Engineering Influence Podcast presented by ACEC and sponsored by the ACEC Life Health Trust. Thanks for